as richly um, as we can. So feel free to do that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, And I wanted, to, before we really started to, we, before we even went over the agenda, I wanted to take a moment and really um, sit with and acknowledge the victims of the shootings here. Um, I wanted to say out loud that uh, what, what I think all of us recognize, which is certainly these killings and also the, hypersexualization of Asian American women is rooted in racism and in misogyny. And we stand with the Asian American community. And this is a, I think, a reminder to all of us of uh, the work we have ahead of us. So it feel, felt important to, um, to pause with this. Um, before moving forward in terms of standing uh, in solidarity with those victims, with their families, with the community. And um, let me now say a little bit about our agenda. Um, we're going to be starting with uh, a, a relatively brief um, description of each of the various kinds of troubler work um, that's underway. Uh, we have a number, and I wanna especially do this because we have a lot of new people here today, which is just wonderful, but I'm hoping this will give, it, give you a sense of the work that we're doing. We'll also talk a little bit more in depth about the new troubler work. There are several areas of work that we are just launching, and we are gonna be recruiting hard for help with those. Um, we're going to be hearing, we have, we have been joined by a number of extraordinary disability rights advocates. They joined us at our last meeting, they're with us, and we want to hear just a little bit about, um, about the organizations that they are connected to and the work they've been doing. So we will hear about ADAPT GA and Rev Up Georgia. We will then be hearing from Anton Flores, who uh, heads an, an organization that's called Casa Alterna and um, that, that works with people recently released from detention. And we are hoping that they will be one of our new strong partners. Um, we will also then be hearing from Representative Dr. Jasmine Clark with our legislative update. We are delighted that she couldn't be here with us. And then we're gonna do some, some small and fairly informal um, um, uh, breakouts, just because we have a lot of new folks and we're, this is just really gonna be about getting a better sense of each other. Um, Robin is reminding me, I, I had said earlier that we ha are, have now um, closed caption availability. Um, Again, thanks to Zan for helping us work that out. Uh, and that's available at the bottom of the screen. If you have any issues or problems with that, feel free to put something in the chat and we will try to address it as, uh, as quickly as we can. And again, let me also say, uh, because a few people have joined us, great, great and glorious welcome to the folks who are joining us for the first time. If, you, if, if, you, if this is your first necessary trouble meeting, if you would put your name and your email in the chat, that would be lovely. And, um, and we will both acknowledge you, we'll know you're here and we will follow up with you later. Um, let me keep going here. Let me talk a little bit about the, the work that is currently underway, um, that necessary trouble um, has going on. And the, the first piece of that that I want to mention is criminal justice reform. And the specific um, shape of criminal justice reform that the current work group is working on is uh, promoting the pairing of police and sheriff departments with mental health providers, both for the immediate response to emergency 911 calls that arise from behavioral health crisis 
and also to support the follow-up so that the situation can be stabilized and that there is a reduced need for future emergency intervention. Um, hopefully to help avoid some of the um, some of the tragic results we've seen. If, if you are interested in, uh, in criminal justice reform, if you would put, we're going to be recruiting all the way through here. Um, if you are interested in helping us work with criminal justice reform, please put your name in the chat with criminal justice reform with it, and we will follow up with you. A second area that we are that we are uh, have our eyes closely on is redistricting. We're doing this work with our partner organization, uh, Fair Districts Georgia, our sister organization. Um, redistricting is upon us this year. Fair Districts Georgia is working to um, mitigate the potential extremely negative effects of the Republicans being in charge of. Um, of the redistricting process, and they would love your help. They would love your help with helping with education, with research, with advocacy, and with communication. And if you are interested in helping with the redistricting reform process, again, if you would put your name in the chat, uh, and we will follow up with you. Let me also say that we'll be doing a deeper dive both into criminal justice reform and in re and redistricting in our next meeting. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly this time because we have a full uh, a full agenda, but, uh, but at future meetings, we will go deeper into them. Um, election protection. Right now that work looks specifically like all, whoops, sorry about that, like all the, oops like the, um, the calls to action we're sending out for these restrictive voting bills. Um, we are also starting to do some work gathering voting stories with Fair Fight. If you are interested in election protection work, please put your name in the chat with the words election protection and we will get back to you. Um, immigrant refugee issues. We'll be talking a good bit about those uh, later as we hear from Anton Flores. Uh, that has that is always um, one of the issues that we um, that we that we try to keep an ongoing work group of. We are also um, doing precinct-based organizing in partnership with the DeKalb Dems. If you are interested, if you even want to hear more about precinct-based organizing with the DeKalb Dems, put your name in the chat. And, um, and Pat Bird and PJ will get back to you um, and then talk about it and then connect you with the training available through DeKalb Dems. Um, very often what we have is we have updates in the following, in the following areas. Um, and the updates are, uh, we have, a, leg we have a, a small group doing legislative tracking. Um, and I wanna just do a shout out to Molly Perry, Paula Anderson and Aquaria Smith in particular, who have had the overwhelming job of tracking the multitude of election uh, restrictive bills. Um, this time we'll be, since we'll be joined by representative Jasmine Clark, we'll be hearing from her instead of from our small team. Um, Another, another area where we often have updates are is the um, Georgia voter, voter Guide. And the Georgia Voter Guide has been coordinated by Necessary Trouble, but we have had over a hundred volunteers working on it uh, over the last couple of years. And we are tracking all 7,000 races in Georgia. And it is a beast of a piece of work. And Mary Lou, if you would put just the link to the Georgia Voter Guide in the chat so people who want to can take a look at it. We will hear more about it um, again at other times. We will also be tracking the municipal elections and trying to keep you up to date on those and also tracking the 2022 elections. Um, and ju just a mention of two other groups that are underway, the Embodied Anti-Racism Group, working their way through uh, My Grandmother's Hands. Uh, and also we have a small group doing letters to corporations re-election um, integrity. 
And then we have three areas of, uh, of, of work that we are just launching. And, um, and this, I wanna just ask folks who are uh, heading up this work to just take you know, a minute or two to describe what that work is and, uh, and we're gonna do a little recruiting for it. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share. Um, Martha Laird, would you unmute yourself and say a little bit about the steering group for Necessary Trouble and our diversification effort? And you're still muted. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't find the button. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, well, um, now I guess it's been a couple of months ago that uh, those of us in Necessary Trouble realized that um, in order to really do um, work in transforming from a segregated racist society, that we ourselves had to embody that within our own group. So we've been putting an effort into actually um, working on how we diversify our own membership so that um, we can um, reflect the change that we're trying to be a part of. Um, so, and I guess, so we've been putting an effort into reaching out to our own um, friends, connections, and maybe some of you are here today because of that. Um, for whatever reason, we're glad you're here. Um, and in order to keep that going, um, as we all know, any significant change, either as an individual or a group, takes time and it takes conscious effort. So in that regard, in order to um, put intention behind our diversification of necessary trouble. And we white folks realize very frankly, our own lives. Um, we it would thought it would probably be a good idea to have a small group within necessary trouble who would be like, if you wanna call it a steering committee, a planning group, something like that, that would be figuring out ways to support and encourage us in this work, as well as mon help us monitor our progress. So this is a group that would be maybe three, my, um, let me back up a second. Myself and Madeline Tesler, who is on here, but you can't see her or you couldn't a minute ago because she's sick in the bed from her shot. Uh, but anyway, um, she, um, we have volunteered um, to coordinate this group and we're looking for three or just three or four other people who would plan with us. So this is a planning group, not a study group or a dialogue group. It's so that we would plan together and come up with ways to encourage and support all of us as we work on this diversification effort. Um, how, I'm sure you're asking yourself, well, how much time would this take, Martha? Well, I'm not totally sure. It may be as much as two times a month we might meet. Um, for maybe an hour. Um, it's not an intensive thing, but and it, how long would it last? As long as we thought it was necessary. I, I, you can tell I'm not totally positive about that. So um, again, as Becky's been saying, if you're interested in, the, in being one of these three or four people, put your name in the chat and call it steering group, or I've seen, some people have called it planning group. However, to for diversity, that would be great. Is that enough, uh, Becky? Anything Perfect. I know should have said. Perfect. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And so, if you want to carry this deeply and help us deeply with this, we would welcome and invite you to put your name in the chat. Thank you so much. Uh, this is, as 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 those who have been uh, with us for a while know, right at the top of our list in terms of priority and awareness right now. Um, Okie dokie. We are going uh, the next the next area of troubler work that is launching. Um, Pat Bird, would you unmute yourself and say a little bit about it? 
you know, we had uh, realized suddenly after the elections were over that we'd put so much thought and energy and time into working for our candidates to get them elected. We hadn't thought about what do we do to support them after they get elected? What do we do to try to make sure that they actually achieve the goals uh, that we had uh, uh, worked for with them? Uh, so what we're doing now is creating some models for how that, that might work. Uh, one kind of thing, if you ask a person after elected, what they need is they need more money. Um, but one of the things that grassroots groups don't have is a lot more money. Uh, so we might do some small scale fundraising for particular projects. But the bigger thing is going to be finding out how we can use the skill sets that we bring to this work to help our electeds achieve their work better, achieve the goals that we have and that they have for themselves. Uh, we're working now with Deborah Gonzalez to create a couple of models for both of these things. So uh, to work with um, how, for example, every time we talk to electeds, one of the things that comes up is wanting to get grants to do this, that, and the other. And so what we wanna do is put together a team of those of us who've had various kinds of experiences with writing, maintaining, uh, whatever to do with, with grants. And that's one of the things that we're asking now today is there will be a, uh, a forum coming out to everyone to ask you uh, to, to give us some information about the skills that you bring to this work to see if we can match those skills with, uh, with this task of, of providing help to our elected, our elected. So uh, you'll be getting that. I think uh, Jenny's working on it and it'll be out in the next few weeks, I think. Wonderful. And Pat, is there anything you need from people today? Or do you want to if wait? If anybody is interested in helping us with this work um, of following up, uh, I actually think of this as the keep on keeping on group. So uh, you could put something in chat about being interested in following up with people that we've helped to get elected. So we're thinking about uh, Jasmine Clark, Deborah Gonzalez, um, um, perhaps Carolyn Bordeaux. Becky, can I say one quick thing? Absolutely. So um, just to follow up, so Deborah Gonzalez was elected um, in November and she is, I think, probably the most progressive district attorney in Georgia right now. And she is talking about bringing all sorts of criminal justice reform into the Athens Oconee area. And that would be a good example of the kind of person we would be helping get grants for to do really kind of cool criminal justice reform types of projects. Okay, that's it. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to just, before I talk about this next category, I also wanted to circle back um, because we've had a few new folks um, also join us. If this is your first Necessary Trouble meeting, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad you're here. There's Michael Andrews, Ibrahim, I see. I think we just saw, we saw also um, Dr. Salary arrive, Dr. Torian Salary, welcome. And we also just have Kay Renee Robertson arrived, who is an extraordinary civil rights activist and has a voice that will lift you to heaven. So um, Kay Renee, welcome, welcome to everyone else. If this is your first Troubler meeting, um, if you would uh, again put your name and email in the chat, we are uh, we would love to to recognize you and acknowledge you, and we are so glad you're here. Um, the the third area that we are just kind of starting to launch work with is that we have been contacted by an organization called Poder Latinx, and it is an advocacy uh, and voter engagement op, uh, organization for the Latinx community. And they uh, would very much like to partner with Necessary Trouble to do voter registration for young Latinx people 
who are just turning 18. This would be in schools, it would be at events, it will all be outside, it will, so, you know, it won't be in terms of COVID precautions that will still be in place. Um, they would love our help. And it seems like <clears throat> a wonderful piece of work for us to do. We, we need folks who uh, are willing to do that. And we would also actually love anybody who is willing to either lead or co-lead that work. So if you are willing either to lead or co-lead it, or if you are even willing just to volunteer with that work, if you would put your name in the chat and put voter, regist voter registration, that would be really wonderful. We would, we are, we are hoping to snag somebody who's willing to head that work up. And again, we're we are hoping to snag a fair number of um, um, of, uh, of volunteers to help in that. Um, at this point, we are going to. I had I had said a little bit earlier um, that we have been very fortunate in being in having joined. Um, uh, having been joined last Troubler meeting by a number of extraordinary disability rights advocates. And we wanted to hear from them about the organizations that they work with. Um, so Jessica Mathis is going to start by just giving us just a little introduction to Rev Up Georgia. Jessica, thank you. And thank you for also testifying against these awful restrictive voting bills last week. We appreciate you. Yes. Um, good afternoon, Troublers, Buenos Cardas, uh, Buenos Diaz, and thank you very much for having us at this meeting. I'm a part of, of ADAPT GA, and we are a grassroots organization that helps advocate for people with disabilities. <laughs> um, we are also a part of Rev Up Georgia Grassroots Connectors. And we are a coalition of disability advocates around Georgia that work on voter registration issues, uh, healthcare issues, anything that is concerning people with disabilities as it relates to our lives. That could include health, voter registration, transportation. Um, we ultimately want uh, people with disabilities to be able to have access in all areas. Now, what we've been working on Thus far is we have been working on the voter reg uh, voter suppression bills, um, five House Bill five three one and two forty one, and the reason why we as a disability community uh, are concerned about these bills is because it takes away the use of the absentee ballot and it also it, 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 it has a clause in it where they don't allow for line warming, meaning that you can't give a person a snack or a drink of water when they're waiting for these <clears throat> um, voter lines or voting, waiting to get in line for voting. Um, the absentee ballot is very important to people with disabilities because the vast majority of us have either transportation issues or we have issues where we cannot leave home. Like we have seniors uh, with disabilities in nursing facilities, uh, people who have a very uh, fragile medical condition that may not be able to get out. And the voter, and despite how the absentee ballot is being portrayed, it actually holds a lot of power. So what we're asking everyone to do is please support us 
in maintaining the integrity of the absentee ballot because it helps us to have greater access and it helps us to make our voice heard. And we're having one more issue is along with the absentee ballot is that we're having to submit IDs like state IDs, uh, driver's license. Many of us with disabilities may not have an ID or may not have a driver's license or may not even have a place where we can make copies of it. So therefore it makes it harder for us to access. So we're asking that you stand with us to make it easier for us to vote and make voting more accessible for all people with disabilities, regardless of what it is. Thank you so much, Jessica. Butch, do you want to add some more for uh, ADAPT? Reverend Butch, are you on? Hello, everybody. This is Reverend Butch Brosman. I am the co-chair of Georgia ADAPT. Uh, Georgia ADAPT is a grassroots network of disability rights activists. Uh, whereas other groups will try to do legislative measures, uh, advocacy work that uh, Jessica has laid out, ADAPT likes to take things to the next level. Uh, we specialize in doing that good old fashioned John Lewis good trouble. Uh, we like to organize, uh, teach people how to organize and stage uh, nonviolent civil disobedience protests. Uh, we have been doing this work since the late 70s uh, with a group in Denver called the Gang of 19. Uh, who staged a protest in the middle of downtown Denver, changing themselves to buses uh, in order to get public transportation accessible for disabled people. Uh, that sparked a national movement. There were adapt chapters uh, started to focusing on that work that popped up all over the country. Uh, from there, uh, they all came together, worked on getting accessible public transportation uh, available nationwide. Uh, ADAPT was the folks who staged the Capitol crawl protest in order to ensure the passage of the American Dis with Disabilities Act. Uh, ADAPT was also the group who were staging the protest at the Senate offices when they tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act a few years ago. Uh, we're continuing to do the work we do uh, to safeguard the protections of all disabled people in the community, uh, most especially to keep them out of institutional by settings and try to keep them in the community uh, and making sure they are getting the healthcare services uh, that they would need in order to stay in the community. Uh, is there anything else you would like me to touch on, Zan? No, I was going to jump on and say that one of the things we did uh, during the runoff is we had um, rides. We provided rides for people with disabilities. We had over 500 people request rides. And so, like, for example, somebody's blind, we set them up with a driver who understood uh, how to do visual descriptions. For example, uh, Ms. Simmons, I think it's her name. She said, this is the first time I knew my ballot counted. She went in there and, and the machines now are not accessible. They are not accessible. Um, and so she went in there with somebody that could audio describe the ballot and the screen. And she said, this is the first time I knew my ballot was safe because before they'd say, oh, let me do this, honey. And, and, and so um, one of our, our kind of sub, sub, I don't know, subcategories is we have uh, native to native, which is a disability for natives with native people trying to get them to the polls. And that's just about all I, I have. Thanks. Good job, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, y'all.
Uh, we feel just, um, I cannot tell you how grateful we are to have you with us. And um, one of the things I would add just in the, in the realm of nonviolent action is Zan happened to mention to me the other day that she has been arrested in nonviolent protest 26 times. So these guys are really doing the work and um, we appreciate the work you do and we are with you. And so um, when we can be with you in, a, in, a, in whatever visible way, we will be there. Many thanks uh, to all of you for all of your work and for helping us know it more deeply. Um, uh, yes, and Mary Lou says, so excited to be collaborating with you. Yes, this is a wonderful partnership. Um, and there is, Butch, Butch is putting in the, 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 um, uh, the, the contact list, uh, contact information. Um, and Robin Shahar is saying, please let us know when and how we can support your efforts. Absolutely. And if anybody hasn't read or seen Jessica's uh, testimony to the legislature last week, it's in the most recent update. Very powerful. And at this point, um, we are going to move a little bit. And, <clears throat> and I would like to turn this over to Nicoleta Smarelia who is our point person for immigrant refugee issues to introduce Anton Flores. Nicoleta, would you unmute yourself and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Becky. Um, we connected with Anton Flores through our very own Connie Rose. So thank you, Connie. Anton Flores Maisonet is the founding director of Casa Alterna. Since 2006, Anton has been on the front lines of the struggle for immigrant justice. Anton is also a charter member of Georgia Detention Watch and the lead founder of El Refugio, the hospitality house for loved ones of those detained at Stewart Detention Center. Casa Alterna, located at Atlanta Friends Meeting, offers lodging, accompaniment, and assistance at no cost to individuals and families fighting for asylum and against deportation. So Anton, thank you for joining us. We're so glad you're here and we look forward to hearing more about you and your work. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, and it is, it is great to be here and I got a chance to kind of uh, pan the, uh, the screen and recognized a lot of familiar faces and some familiar names. Uh, and I loved hearing of all the witnesses, the ways that, that many of you have witnessed for a more beautiful world that our heart know is possible. Um, so I just wanted to share, I'm gonna share this opportunity with Connie and then also Ibrahim. And so let me be brief and so that we can also hopefully have some time for some Q and A. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know that I am here in Decatur at the Atlanta Friends Meeting uh, where we have a beautiful collaborative partnership with the Atlanta Friends Meeting and Casa Alterna. I am the founder of Casa Alterna, which started in 2006, but uh, my wife and I actually moved into the Friends Meeting about a year and a half ago. When COVID uh, struck a year ago, there was an opportunity and rumors of an opportunity that there would be mass releases from Georgia's immigration detention centers. Um, and so out of that, out of those rumors, out of that uh, potential crisis, a team emerged that responded to immigrants and asylum seekers that were being released from immigration detention and just being dropped off at the Atlanta airport. Uh, that team has continued to grow and continue to develop, although we're still very much in the pioneering stage. However, in July, we, be, we were able to add a second component to this work and that many of the individuals when they're being released from detention, and these are again, individuals that are being released into the United States. So not those that are being deported, but those who are being allowed to stay for various reasons, um, but need assistance to get home uh, to whatever their new home is or, or, or reunified if they were already living here in the United States and reunified with their family after detention separation. Um, but many need overnight uh, hospitality. And so, out of this work has, has grown two facets. One we call you know, accompaniment, which is assisting the individuals at the airport, at the Greyhound station, as they come out of detention, um, 
many times they've been detained for upwards of two months, um, or sorry, two years. Uh, and, um, and then the other, the other component being hospitality here at the Atlanta Friends meeting. Just to give you a little bit of numbers, I had, do not know, I know we have a collaboration now with, with a group that started out of Indivisible Columbus uh, that is now called Pasamigos. So they are our liaison, our contacts in Columbus, Georgia. And in collaboration with them, I would be guessing that during uh, COVID, we've probably accompanied about 500, uh, again, immigrants and asylum seekers that have been liberated from our detention centers and are needing some assistance to get navigate through the airport, to get to the bus station, providing them with backpacks, with food, with snacks, uh, all manners of things to accompany them on their journey. But in terms of just the overnight hospitality, I just wanted to give you some numbers. Um, since July, we have hosted 145 guests here at Casa Alterna at Atlanta Friends Meeting, representing 36 different countries um, and uh, every continent except Antarctica. The biggest group has been uh, individuals seeking asylum from Cuba and uh, Cuban asylum seekers are often the ones who are confronting or facing a year up to two years in detention. And our numbers have increased significantly since the Biden administration came in, but there's a couple of factors that relate to that. One is the Biden administration's new priorities and the other is lawsuits uh, against the prior administration um, for lengthy detentions of individuals who were at high risk for the worst uh, symptoms of, of COVID-19. So the, just for example, just in the last 12 days, where, where, whereas it took us eight months to reach 100 guests, in the last 12 days here at Atlanta Friends Meeting, we have hosted uh, 45 guests. So 100 guests in eight months, 45 guests in less than, less than two weeks. 90% of our guests are again here just for one night or less. Uh, about a 10% of them need longer stays, uh, averaging about two weeks. At present, we have uh, two wonderful guests, um, and I invited one to kind of share with us. And so I'm going to make space for Ibrahim to just talk a bit about his experience of being at Irwin County Detention Center, a detention center that has been uh, unfortunately in the news all too often because of its notorious medical malpractice and unethical um, treatment of, of immigrants detained there. So I'll allow him to speak about his, his uh, experience there and then how he ended up here with us at Casa Alterna now is really kind of our resident staff. So Ibrahim uh, originates from Nigeria uh, and is also a wonderful reggae and R&B artist, a musician, recorded artist. So Ibrahim, who's to my right, and I don't know where he is on your screen. <laughs> hey, hello, everyone. Yes, um, <laughs> I've been in, um, I was in detention for 11 months and um, during the process of um, being uh, in detention, I was sexually abused. You know, I was uh, I was sexually abused uh, by a detainee, and um, after which I, I was abused. They still uh, punished me by, by taking me. Uh, I was going through uh, depression and anxiety. You know, so I was I was at that process. I was still after uh, I was detained. The um, deputy warden had me stressed out, like I was I was locked in the hole for two weeks stating that they they will they, they wanted to protect me and then um, i was told to sign um a, a, to put onto a record that um, i wasn't trying to um sue the facility for nothing i'm like i'm not suing the facility it's all about my medical conditions because i was going through tra um, trauma and um it took like um two weeks before i was released from the hole and um uh, after which i was released by eyes based on uh, my uh, medical conditions. I was having um, high blood pressure, which is hypertension, and um, acute stress. So after I was being released, I was to go back to my house. I found that my wife is, was already having some other men in the house, which um, I was introduced to Mr. Anton, and Mr. Anton was able to accommodate me until I get situated. So this is a little bit of um, thing I've got to say for now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe Ibrahim, you could just share real briefly like uh, what you have noticed in your month of being with us here in terms of what it's been like for you to welcome uh, other, other individuals who've come out of a similar circumstance. It's been a blessing. <laughs> it's been a blessing. And also it's been stressful, <laughs> you know, 
a lot of people has been coming in, in and out, you know, and um, this is a lovely place. Like Mr. Anton is a blessing to us. He's like a father to us. A father was good. And um, we've never lacked lot in being under his care. And um, I really appreciate him. I thank him so much. And then um, Casa and Lana for, uh, or Tana rather, for what he's been doing. And it's a, it's a, it's a good job. And um, I, I, embrace, I embrace everything that has been going on here. Thank you, Ibrahim. So our work has been sustained uh, through many, many, many individuals and organizations. Um, and, and on the front line, um, or well, one on the back line is our ongoing uh, kind of grocery and hospitality team. But on the front line is our accompaniment team. And, um, and that's how I got connected with you all. Connie Rose, who's a member of this, um, of this Good Trouble group is uh, one of our accompaniment team members. And so I'd love to allow you to hear one of your own and one of our own share uh, kind of her own kind of experiences in accompanying individuals coming out of immigration detention. So Connie. Thank you, Anton. Um, anyway, hello everybody. I'll try to be brief though. There's so much going on with this. I would love to spend hours because it's an amazing group. But I just started volunteering about five weeks ago and immediately thought of the troublers, of course, and contacted Nicoletta right away and then Becky because I thought it'd be important for you all to hear what Anton's been doing and also hopefully get some more volunteers. As he said, this last week has been wild. <laughs> We've had a lot of people to work with and it's wonderful they're getting out of there, but um, we've been busy. And um, so essentially, as Anton said, what we are doing is helping with the trans, um, transportation after detention. And just real quickly, what that means is most of the time it's, we go to the airport and um, it's kind of a meet and greet. The detentions who are sent up here from Columbus, um, but their sister group has, you know, given us some names and some information on the um, the amigos. We don't want to call them detainees; they're out there, our amigos. And then if they don't have a plan. We quickly assess it. You know, what is? Do you have a plan? Do you know where you're going to be going in the states? Do you know how you're going to be getting there? If it's airplane, Greyhound, et cetera, if it's gonna to be today or tomorrow. And then we stand inside the airport with our little iPhones, trying to find them a ticket real quick if we can. Because ideally, obviously for them to be on their way that day, I mean, that's what they want and that's what we want for everybody. Um, and then the ones at the airport, we do escort them throughout the airport and we have to do a lot of explaining to everybody. And of course you don't know what language people are gonna be speaking. And I do wanna bring up, you don't have to know Spanish to volunteer by any means. I naively thought, oh, it's gonna be 90% Spanish speaking, but it's not. We have people from all over the world, a lot from Africa, Eastern Europe, Vietnam, I mean, all over the place. And um, so we do get an accompany, a companion pass to go through with them. Some people have never flown before. So just explaining um, airport routines is something new to them. And also getting through security because they don't have a driver's license or a passport to show in security. <laughs> so, you know, they have their ID from the detention center and they have papers saying that they have lawfully been released on their own recognizance and having to deal with the officers there and all. And then some of them may not be able to travel that day. So we contact Anton to let him know that somebody will be there for the night or so. So that's just the logistics. But the reality is when you go to the airport, you just have these names and you, know, you have no idea who these people are. You may know their country, something like that. And then you meet them at the airport because they come up on the um, airport shuttle and then you have a face that you put the name. But again, you're hurrying to trying to figure out their travel arrangements and all. So you still don't know anything really about these people at that point. And then finally you get to the point that either you're gonna take them in your car to Greyhound or you're gonna escort them through the airport. And 
then there's some interactions that go on. And almost all the time, they want to tell you how long they were in detention. And detention, remember, it's just a, another name for jail. They're, they're in jail for wanting asylum, which is legal to apply for asylum in this country. And again, they, they immediately want you to know how long they're in there. The shortest I've heard is four months. And he was only there for four months because he is an American citizen who should not have been picked up. They, oops, made a mistake. He got an attorney, it took them four months to acknowledge their mistake. But other ones, it's usually 14 months, two years, et cetera. And so it starts getting heartbreaking. And then they tell you something else about themselves, like the gentleman who said, his wife and children live in the country here and he's gonna go see them that night. And how the little one was not walking when he got picked up, but now that child's walking. So that milestone, he totally missed, you know, will never get back in his life. But um, so these names on a list, they're quickly in your heart. And <laughs> I'm sorry, it's, it's really hard to work with them because it's terrible what our country has done to them. And then by the time you get to the gate, I always end up apologizing for what our country has done to them. It's terrible and wishing them luck. And you know, you're just this little blip in their life. You know, they've had all this whole life before. They're going to this other life. They still are gonna have issues and problems after that. They, they, you know, they are let out, but they don't know for how long they have to report to their ICE office. They still have legal proceedings, et cetera. So their problems aren't over. But, um, you know, you wish them well and you don't know. I mean, I, I mother every one of them and I apologize for acting like mom. <laughs> Um, Cause then you worry, you don't know, you put them on the plane or the Greyhound bus, what's going to happen to them. But I'll tell you, they are so, so appreciative because once they get out, I mean, their heads are spinning. Some of them don't know they're getting out. It's not like, oh, you, oh you're going to be here for X amount of time and this is your day. They have no idea. So if you get picked up for doing something illegal, at least you go to jail, you know how long you're going to be in there. But these people, they don't know day to day. They may be shipped from one detention center in one state to another state without explanation. And suddenly you're in another state so your family's not even there and can't even visit you. But, and so they all shell shocked and they're all bruised from being in this situation. So I don't know how, without the help, they could possibly get their transportation needs met. I mean, because some don't have money, we have to figure out the money. Some, maybe they have to call their mother or their aunt and all, maybe they'll give them money for the airplane. But if you don't have a phone, it's kind of hard to make that plan. Thank you, Connie. Oh, yes, I will stop. Um, but anyway, it's a great group. We need help. We'd love to have group. And the nice thing is too, it, some volunteer groups, you have to sign up for minimum by the stuff. Anton and the rest of us are glad for any help you can give. And yeah, I'll give you time now, Anton. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure that we, we stay to our teams a lot of time. So um, I've seen some questions in the chat box, and then I want to just pivot real quickly to ways to get involved and then uh, see if there are any other questions. I've seen lots of questions about Ibrahim and uh, Ibrahim. Thank you again, he's to my right, far to my far right. Thank you for your vulnerability. Definitely did not have to share, you know, um, the, the details that he did. Thank you, sir. <laughs> but uh, just, um, with us, uh, he is here. Um, we're hoping, like I said, to keep him on as resident staff. His, his situation is precarious because of his um, uh, victimization. He is eligible for a visa for victims of violent crimes. And, but that will take a number of years. Um, so in the interim, some things that we're trying to pair up uh, Ibrahim with is, is, with, some, is with some counseling, um, some, some uh, pro bono legal representation to, to help out. He's, he's filed, he's, he's basically, you know, um, 
been filing a lot of these um, documents on his own. Um, and so we continue to work with him uh, on that. Uh, with, with Casa Alterna and the work that we're doing, I'll start with the, with the biggest request. Um, and that is, we, again, we have been in the Atlanta Friends meeting and the beauty of it is that the, as the meeting is closed, um, the meeting house is closed, it's, it's given birth to this, to this new opportunity. However, as um, our lives resume some sense of normalcy, uh, the space will again return to its important function, its multi-purpose functions. And so, you know, we will have to confront uh, uh, some, some, some spacing and utilization issues. So, I'm, so the big request, and I always am saying this to any group because I never know who knows of something, is we would love to have a more permanent um, uh, place where we could continue this work. So maybe if you know of a, of a place of worship that has an open, an empty parsonage, or you know someone who has a duplex or something, uh, there are some, some specs that we're looking for in this. So it wouldn't just be any, any house, but we, we are looking for that. Um, but more immediately in terms of the work that, that we have, we are you know, always welcome to having folks shadow us at the airport and, that, and then kind of step into just like an apprenticeship to learn what it means to, to accompany uh, our companions uh, on their journey from being, from, from being liberated from detention uh, onto their reunification with their family. And one second, someone's at the door. Sorry, living in, again, living in a meeting house where other folks uh, come. Um, and then, uh, and then again, we also have our, our grocery team, our hospitality team that provides, that provides uh, groceries. Uh, that's pretty well defined, but we have two new teams that are not even formed yet where we could really use assistance. Uh, one is for anyone who's a, a, a night owl. Um, we would love to um, have some folks work as a host. So that's checking in our guest here at Casa Alterna, going through all of their documents maybe even learning how to uh, connect with their, with their loved ones and, um, uh, and finalize their, their travel plans, things of that nature. That's, so that'll be a brand new team that we have. The second is a less glamorous one, but vitally important. And that's just helping with, with, uh, with cleaning up afterwards. I mean, every day we have to wash the sheet, kind of like you know, hotel house cleaning. Uh, every day we have to wash the sheets, uh, you know, reset all the cots and the beds and restock the kitchen with the, with the goods and things like that. So, so there are a number of ways to get involved. I'm putting my contact information in the chat box. I would also encourage you to go to our website where you can see a lot of the stories of how we are trying to humanize uh, this, this uh, barbaric system of immigration detention. So with that, if there is time, um, I don't know if there's time for questions, but if there is, I'd be glad to, uh, to speak. So what, what I would love, um, Anton, if it's okay, I've just seen that um, Representative Clark has, has joined us already. So if it's okay, if you can hang around and if people have questions, if they would put them in the chat and if you can answer them, would that be all right? Yeah. And, and here's what I would also, um, what I would also ask is that if any of troublers, if any troublers want to be involved with Casa Alterna in any way, if you would put your name in the chat and Nicoletta will send you contact information about how to connect up and then we will also be able to coordinate among ourselves. So if you are able to help Casa Alterna in any way whatsoever, if you would put your name in the chat with some indication um, of, um, and Mary Odom, uh, yeah, great. So you can see some of the questions arising and being answered um, um, answered in the chat. Um, Barbara wants to say something about El Refugio. Barbara, would you mind putting that in the chat also? If you would just put something, whatever you'd like about El Refugio in the chat. I'll that do would that, be, thank that, you. That would be wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Nicoletta, anything else? before we sh keep going? No, I think um, I just wanted to, to thank Anton very much. Um, thank Ibrahim and Connie for the witnessing. Um, I wish the best to Ibrahim. Um, and uh, again, a big thank you to all of them for what they're doing. And I encourage you 
all of you, if there's something, just a little something that you can do to help, um, go ahead and put your name in the chat. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, yes, and our deep, deep gratitude for that extraordinary work that is underway for Ibrahim's willingness to be with us and to be vulnerable and for Anton's extraordinary work and for Connie for connecting us and for Nicoletta for being the conduit and the point person. We are so very grateful. Um, um, before I turn this over to Judy Jones to introduce Representative Jasmine Clark. I wanted to just acknowledge and welcome Commissioner Lorraine Cochran Johnson. Commissioner, we are your biggest fans. We are grateful for all of your work and everything you do. You are our, you are our great hope. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, guys. I, I, I didn't expect any acknowledgement. This isn't about me. This is so much bigger. Um, you know, as I sit here, I see Miss Lemuel, I see so many familiar faces. And every day, as a commissioner and as an individual, I learn more. And Anton, I'm sitting here because I'll reach out personally to you. Um, I probably donate more of my discretionary funds to organizations that foster and improve the lives of all people than anyone else that surrounds me. So I certainly want to help. Um, I appreciate you for who you are. To Connie, never apologize for having a big heart. Um, <laughs> that is never necessary. Um, it's because of people like you that the world becomes a better place. So um, thank you and thank you also, Becky, for all that you do for so many. So. I'm going to be quiet and I'm just going to be present. Well, but reach out to me anytime. I'll put my information in the um, box. I respond to all emails, all phone calls, um, and text messages. I'm totally here to help and be a part of the solution um, because what many of our immigrant community experiences, um, it's beyond reproach. And we need assistance from the highest level. Um, because truly that's where we need to start. But let's do what we can and I'm here to help. So thank you so much, uh, Becky. Thank you so much, Commissioner. We are grateful for you every day. Um, and what I would love to do is to turn this over now to Judy Jones. Judy Jones, um, who, and most folks know this, Judy is part of our Troubler leadership team and is a, the adjunct coordinator. And um, we are so grateful, particularly to have her here today because she has had one heck of a week with being rear-ended in her car and then having a second COVID shot. And she's still here with us to facilitate this next chunk and to introduce um, Jasmine Clark. Judy, I will turn it over to you and I'll also pull up the uh, PowerPoint. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. This, is, this has been so awe-inspiring thus far. Thank you all for attending uh, tonight. This is great. I am so inspired by what we've just heard. And I just wanna say um, thank you all for sharing this evening. Um, as you can see that the content that we've had thus far has just been so very enlightening to what the mission is of our wonderful organization that is Necessary Trouble. And with that, we are going to uh, continue this effort tonight with the content and inf informative information. I am pleased and honored to bring to you what we call a legislator with a lab coat a legislator with a lab coat. Dr. Jasmine Clark was first elected to uh, the Georgia State House of Representatives back in uh, November of 2018. And uh, then in, in 2020, she represents the 108th district of the wonderful state of Georgia. She is a senior lecturer at the Nell Hodgins Woodruff School of Nursing. And for me, in watching her 
uh, just in these last several weeks with the bills that have come up in the legislator, legislature, I should say, uh, she has been one of the most articulate presenters that I have heard to uh, talk about and communicate the specifics of how uh, some of these bills impact voter suppression efforts. And what I mean to say is that for lay people who, who cannot understand what these bills mean, Representative uh, Dr. Clark has been able to articulate them where we can go and talk to our family members, our coworkers, and, and, and in a way to that they can understand how it's going to impact us. So I am so very pleased tonight to welcome uh, Representative Dr. Jasmine Clark to talk with us about these bills and more and uh, that she, she'll be sharing with us on these bills. Uh, so if you could all just get together and give a silent applause and a welcome applause. You can actually, actually do not a silent applause, but an, a, a loud applause. Welcome Representative Dr. Jasmine Clark. Yay. All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, and I apologize if my voice is a little cracky. Um, my daughter had a track meet yesterday and she ran very well. And so mommy was very proud and mommy was also screaming, so. <laughs> I do apologize. Um, I am drinking tea and hope to have my full um, use of my voice again uh, by the time I get to the Capitol on Monday. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, you all uh, may or may not know, but Necessary Trouble holds a very special place in my heart because uh, they were one of the first groups back in 2018 that reached out to me and said, how can we help you? And they wrote so many postcards for me and really helped me to engage voters as a first time candidate and who did not know exactly um, what uh, the campaign trail would bring. And so you all have been invaluable to me. Um, and I uh, feel like you all are a part of my journey. Necessary Trouble is and has always been a part of my journey. In fact, many people in Necessary Trouble were some of my first campaign um, donations. I mean, I'm saying like y'all really took me in under your wing and I will always and forever be appreciative of that. So thank you, thank you, thank you to that um, first. I cannot ever start a meeting with you all without just telling you all thank you because I really truly am grateful. All right, so um, as Judy said, I have spent a lot of time um, trying my best to break down um, the, uh, the bills that have been coming across our desk when it comes to elections in Georgia. Um, here's the, the, um, the nitty gritty of it. So many bills about elections have come across because there is a full blown panic on the GOP when it comes to the realization that when people show up to vote, they lose. And for far too long, they have held this advantage where the laws that were already in place, the suppressive laws that were already in place were good enough for them to keep their, their place in leadership in our, in our state. And um, over time, uh, things change, people change. And honestly, the pandemic, everyone was sitting still long enough to be engaged in the election. And everyone had something that uh, was important to them enough to go out and vote. And they saw their worst nightmare come to fruition. And that is that people showed up and when people show up in record numbers, they lose. And so the reaction to that, the almost immediate reaction to that was how can we cut back the um, ability of so many of these people to vote. And I, I, a lot of times when I say that, or if I say that to a group of people, people are like, well, how do you know? How do you know that they're not really truly concerned about you know, the election? Um, they say it 
out loud, more than one of them has said it. Um, and we're never going to win an election. This is their words. We will never win another election if we don't do something. The last election, the 2020 election, saw record numbers of people vote. Not only did we see record numbers of people vote, but we saw one of the more efficient elections that we've had in a very long time. And that even though a record number of people participated in our election, we did not necessarily see those election day lines the way we normally would see them on election day. Because people took advantage of the three major ways that you can vote in Georgia. Um, we have absentee voting, which in Georgia is no excuse. So people could vote literally from home. Um, and during a pandemic, um, that was important for some people to have the ability to vote without exposing themselves to the virus. Um, people could also choose to vote early. And while I will say in some of the earlier days and the later days of early voting, there were long lines, there was also um, a lot of opportunities for people to vote and they did not have to stand in long lines. And then of course, people can vote on election day. Um, we also employed the use of absentee ballot drop boxes. Um, they were available 24 seven. And so a person could request an absentee ballot, fill out their ballot from the comfort of their home with a glass of tea or a glass of wine or a, a bottle of beer, whatever they want to do. And then they could go to an absentee ballot drop box at any time. Um, and these drop boxes were under 24 hours, seven days a week surveillance, and they could put their ballot into that box. All of these things made for an election that was more accessible than many previous other elections. No one was beholden to necessarily having to use the uh, post office um, with the ballot drop boxes. A lot of people who may not have been able to access stamps were still able to turn in an absentee ballot without a stamp. Um, you know, with, uh, I know in Gwinnett County, I know it's different in different counties because counties run elections and I'll get back to that really quickly. Um, there was different uh, schedules, but for the most part here in Gwinnett County, we had two weekends, Saturday and Sunday of early voting and many, many, many uh, people in Gwinnett County took advantage of voting on the weekend. So all of these things, again, led to historic turnout and with that, the GOP panicked. And so now they have um, introduced these bills that will cut back absentee ballots by saying that you have less time to apply for your ballot. That's number one. Not only will you have less time to apply for the ballot, but the county elections boards have less time to issue a ballot. So we already had trouble with getting ballots issued. I feel like that was one of the things during the election that was very um, concerning was that there were some people that requested a ballot and it never showed up in their mailbox. And so they are now trying to cut back that time in half, literally from 49 days out to 29 days, which would put um, our county election workers at a horrible disadvantage and make it very, very difficult, even if fewer people voted by absentee, shrinking this window of time is going to be an incredible burden. Um, not only did they um, decrease access to when you can apply for your ballot and access to when your ballot can be issued by the county, but they have also uh, shrunk the amount of time that um, we can have early voting. Now, what they will tell you is that, well, for the majority of counties, um, this actually is an increase in the amount of early voting. And that's not, um, that's not inaccurate. Um, several uh, counties in rural Georgia did not have the capacity to have as much early voting, or at least that's what they said. Um, however, they will, what they leave out of that statement is that for all of the major metro counties where the bulk of votes are actually coming from, and let's be honest, a bulk of Democratic votes are coming from, it will reduce the amount of hours by a significant amount. Instead of having two weekends of voting, early voting, counties will have to choose between either two Saturdays or one Saturday and one Sunday. 
This makes it, and not just any Saturday or Sunday, a specific Sunday. And if they choose a specific Sunday, which would be the first day of voting. So your voting would start on Sunday. It would go to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There would be no voting that next weekend. So Saturday and Sunday, no voting. Then you would have Monday through Saturday of that second week. That is a very confusing early voting schedule that is completely unnecessary. I am sorry, my dog is very excited about all of the people going to walks today. Um, I apologize. Um, so, um, you know, it is a reduction for a large number of voters. And that is not, um, it's not acceptable. But again, their argument will be, well, we're increasing early voting for others. So that should be a good thing. You should be happy about that. Um, the other thing that they are trying to do, one of the most egregious provisions in this, uh, in these bills, um, is that they are making it to where if a person votes out of precinct, then their entire provisional ballot will be thrown away. Nothing on that ballot will count. Currently, if you vote provisional and you vote out of precinct, only the races that you were ineligible to vote in are discarded. Now they would say, if you voted out of precinct, even if you could vote for president and you could vote for governor and you could vote for that Senate race and you could vote for that uh, uh, public service commission race and that secretary of state race, all those statewide, all the countywide, all of those um, other races that you would have been eligible to vote for, they all get thrown away too. And so I fundamentally believe that that cannot be constitutional to just throw away people's votes because they showed up at the wrong precinct. And the reason why that bothers me is because many of you know my story where in 2018, I went to go vote and they told me I was at the wrong precinct. I was on the ballot, so I knew I was not at the wrong precinct. However, if I had not been as knowledgeable or if I did not have as much time as I had uh, to try to fix the situation, I could have been given a provisional ballot or I could have been sent away to another precinct and then given a provisional ballot there. If this law that they're trying to pass now was in effect, I would not have even been able to vote for myself they would have thrown out my entire ballot. And so this is important. It's not just about people showing up to just any precinct to try to just vote for something. Yes, that does happen. But sometimes it is a, um, a, a clerical or administrative error that has you at the wrong precinct and you should not be disenfranchised because of that. And then the last thing I'll bring up is that they want to take those very popular on both sides of the aisle. Many, many Georgians found this to be one of the uh, easiest ways to vote. The very popular um, absentee ballot drop boxes, which were available 24 seven. So I could drop off that ballot at six o'clock AM. I could drop it off at 9 PM. I could also drop it off the Monday before the election when there's no voting going on, but I could still drop off my ballot. They want to limit the uh, availability of those absentee drop ballot drop boxes to only inside of early voting locations and only when the early voting location is open. That again, significantly reduces the uh, availability of the ballot drop box and honestly makes them functionally useless. If I still have to go into a voting precinct, then you have basically uh, neutered the, the, the purpose of the absentee ballot drop box. And then one last thing, and then I'll stop and I'll take questions. Um, this latest bill, SB 202, and let's be clear, SB 202 is a bill that was two pages on Friday morning and was 94 pages one hour before it was heard in committee. And since it was heard in committee, it has, it has since um, been changed even more. And 
while it'll be heard in committee on Monday morning and possibly voted on on Monday morning, there has been very little time for people to actually dissect those, um, those uh, bills, this bill. But one of the things that's in that bill is basically allowing the state election board, which is a partisan election board, to take over county election boards that they deem um, are not um, working you know, efficiently enough for them. Why is this so dangerous? Number one, it's extreme overreach. But number two, it could essentially achieve what the January insurrection, January 6th insurrection did not achieve. It would allow the state to basically delay or prevent certification of elections and throw out ballots and all of the things that we were able to stop because the Secretary of State said, look, everything passed muster. We have counted, recounted, audited. We've literally done every single thing possible to show you that the results are the results. Um, and um, that's very scary. And I'll mention this in that same provision, they also um, punish or retaliate against the Secretary of State by effectively removing him as a voting member from the state election board. Um, and while anyone who knows me knows that Secretary of State Raffensperger is not my best friend by any stretch of the imagination, I recognize that him standing up to them and telling them that our elections were run the way they were, they, they were run efficiently and the results are the results, they are now retaliating against him for that. And so this is, um, it's really important um, for people to understand what's happening right now and the consequences that could come from these really bad provisions in this bill. And there's so much more. It's 94 pages. I won't go through every single solitary detail, um, but I would love to take questions if anyone, have, anyone has any questions about the bill, about something you might have heard about the bill, or something I didn't get a chance to cover in my introduction. So thank you again. Um, I'd love to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Dr. Clark. We, we appreciate that overview. We, uh, we do have some questions for you, of course. Um, I wanna say um, you have, as I reiterated before, or I stated before, you've given a, a real, really great high level overview of what's going on with those bills. So um, one of the questions that we have that I want to address, um, which bills actually, which bills are, is the governor not supporting? And do you think the governor will refuse to sign the bills if they pass? Can you address those questions? Absolutely. So um, the governor has really, really been pretty tight-lipped about what he supports and does not support. So um, we are not really sure about what he will sign. However, I will say that the Lieutenant Governor was very outspoken about being um, against um, what was Senate Bill 241. He was so against it that he gave up the gavel and um, went and sat in his office and did not preside over the vote. Now, while some people might say that's really brave of him, I thought it was very cowardly of him to basically run away from his duties um, instead of standing up and saying, we don't need to vote for this. Um, that said, um, and the interesting thing about that, I don't know how it is on the Senate side because I'm not in the Senate, but in the House, um, the Speaker of the House has 100% authority over what bills come to the floor. So it's like he brought a bill to the floor and then he put on this show about how he's so against it. Um, but that said, the provision that he was against the most was um, getting rid of no excuse absentee voting. And so I do believe that all of the bills that will potentially get a vote, um, that is no longer on the table. So uh, Georgia will likely keep no excuse absentee voting, but it's going to look very different. And it is going to, they're, they're trying different ways to still make it um, a little more difficult 
or in my opinion, in their, in their and not in my opinion, I, we know this, in their attempt to make it quote more secure, they are actually making it less secure. Um, they want to replace signature matching, which again, had its own issues. I mean, I'm in Gwinnett where they were throwing out ballots like crazy in 2018. Um, but, you know, um, um, signature matching is one of the most secure ways to um, validate an absentee ballot um, because it, your signature is one of the few things that is actually unique to you. Now, again, I know that signature matching is not um, necessarily um, the best, but it, it is better than what they are proposing, which is to put driver's license numbers or the last four of your social on there. Not mm -hmm. only because it could be, it could make people um, victims of identity fraud, but because victims of identity fraud could find that they have quote already voted and they didn't vote yet. Um, I, you know, in some of the more uh, darker circles of the internet, you can buy a list of driver's license numbers. Um, I know that, you know, and, and we don't know if people will use those types of things, but no other state uses driver's license numbers in this way for this reason. And so again, I think in their attempt to make things more secure, they're actually making them less secure. Um, and so uh, I, I say all that to say that we'll still have no excuse absentee ballots. Um, and I'm happy about that, but I'm still concerned with the um, what they're trying to do to no excuse absentee voting in this process. Okay, thank you for that. Um, what as constituents, uh, can we do uh, in support of your stances for these bills? In um, in other words, um, what can, what can we do? We we know that we we can write, we can go out, and we can protest in front of the Capitol. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that that we can do as constituents? So um, here's what I've told another group and I will tell you all the same thing. The people on those committees need to hear from you. They need to hear from you whether you're calling them, whether you're emailing them, whether you're writing them a letter or writing them a postcard. They need to hear from you. And don't use a form letter. Um, don't use um, a form or you know, like a, a mass email. Um, we, what I would say is really good to include in any communication um, is how this might hurt you as a voter. But what you should not include in, any, in your communication is that you're a Democratic voter who votes Democrat and you're afraid that they're trying to get rid of Democratic votes. The more um, ambiguous you can be about what type of voter you are, and more you can just talk about being a voter, the more likely you might get to someone who is worried about their own voters. Um, and especially if these people are your actual representative, that's even better. Um, this is really important. Um, when it comes to um, communication, um, representatives care about their votes. They care about losing votes. Um, making it as plain as possible that they're, that you're afraid that if they show up at, if you show up at the wrong precinct, you might not get a chance to vote for them or, you know, whatever. Um, that's really important. So I would say strategic, very strategic email and letter writing is where we are right now. Um, what we saw in the Senate is that a handful of senators, um, stood up to and voted against, or I don't know if they voted against or they walked, but they would not vote for the Senate omnibus bill. Though it's no coincidence that those handful of senators are in mostly metro areas um, in districts where they had to fight for their seat in 2020. Uh, they can't afford to lose any votes. They can't. Um, and they can't really afford to appear super extreme because that's not what their districts look like. 
And so I think it's important to bring that point home. Um, we have a, we still have some Republican um, House members who are in that same position. People like um, Sharon Cooper, who barely won her election. Uh, people, you know, in in areas that are are changing, very purple areas. Let them hear from you. Let them um, understand that you know this extreme extremism might work in some of the deep red parts of the state. But in her very purple district, she's going to lose votes and she might lose her election. Okay. So, so we, we need to, to make sure that we're communicating to uh, our representatives in those areas. Actually, in all of the areas, we need all to communicate. Them. All of them. Yeah. And especially okay. committee members. And um, choose one thing. You know, they've got these really big bills. And I promise you, if you write them a six page letter covering every single thing you hate about the bill, you're gonna lose them. Choose whatever is most important to you and just write about that. Um, mm -hmm. And even if everyone's writing about the same thing, it's fine. Just choose that thing that you feel like you can confidently speak about and talk about that thing to your representative as well as all of the chairs. And if you send mm -hmm. out the same letter to multiple people, that's fine. Just make sure to use blind CC and not regular CC. Because if they see a whole bunch of names in the uh, two bar, mm -hmm. they're less likely to feel like it's personalized to them. So yeah. blind CC or just copy and paste into separate emails. Yeah. And so as specific and personal as it can be, make it that way and send those out uh, individually to, to the, to your representatives, um, is what I'm hearing. Okay. Um, we do have another question for you. Um, so we have one that says representative Clark, we thank you for your explanations and insight today. And absolutely we do. Uh, do you know if the federal voting rights bill that passed the house, quote unquote, we're still holding out hope for the Senate. Do you know uh, if the federal voting rights bill that passed the House will reverse each of the items contained in the pending Georgia bills? Um, it may not reverse each of them, but it can reverse some of the worst of those bills. Um, we're still going to have to fight for some things right here at home, but that federal legislation uh, would, will provide protections such as protections for the early voting schedules and protection for the absentee voting schedules, um, things like that. It will actually provide some protections for um, voting that right now um, we are at the mercy of our state, state legislature unless there's a federal law that basically supersedes what we do here in the state. Okay, thank you. Do we know when the committees will be voting? So, um, you know, half the time we don't even know when the committees are meeting. Um, but I will say this, um, 8.30 a.m., the Special Committee on Election Integrity um, is going to meet um, to discuss a SB 202. And again, this is a bill that I listened to it and the song Turning Point, um, and that's where I learned it. So it's not very um, um, methodical, like a uh, lyrical song. It's a speaking, talk speaking kind of song. So I'll just give you the words and sing it as she sang it, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's Turning Point. See the little brown girl, she looks as old as me. She looks just like chocolate. Oh, mommy, can't you see? We are both in first grade. She sat next to me. I took care of her, ma, when she skinned her knee. She sang a song so pretty on the jungle gym. When Jimmy tried to hurt her, I punched him in the chin. 
Ma, can she come over and play dolls with me? We could have such fun, Ma. Oh, Ma, what did you say? Why not? Why not? Hmm. Oh, I see. So that's Turning Point by Nina Simone. <clears throat> oh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Hey, mm. mm. Renee, so, thank, thank you so you're much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. But I think Mary for her story, because it, that the, her story brought to mind that song and her experience of what brought her to activism. Yes. Mm. Thank you so very mm. much. You're welcome. That was wonderful. Um, and, and let me read uh, just a couple of these. Judy, Judy Jones, shout out to Thomas James from Scraven County. Thank you, Thomas, for joining us. Um, um, Michelle? Yes. Are you, are you still there? Do you want to unmute yourself and also sing? Well, sure. If okay. they want to hear another song, sure. Are everybody okay for one more song? It might, it might take us two minutes over. You uh -oh. all right for one uh -oh. more song? Uh-oh. Okay, here we go. Am I, is my thing off? Isn't it, it is. Yeah. It is. Okay. It's perfect. This is how it seems very appropriate for t tonight. <clears throat> I am open. I am willing to be hopeless. Would seem so strange. It dishonors those who've gone before us so lift me up to the light of change there is hurting in my family there is sorrow in my town there is panic in the nation, there is wailing the whole world round. But I am open and I am willing, for to be hopeless would be so strange. It dishonors those who've gone before us so lift me up to the light of change may the children see more clearly may the elders be more wise may the winds of change caress us, even though it burns our eyes. For I am open and I am willing, for to be hopeless would seem so strange. It dishonors those who've gone before us so lift me up to the light of change give me a mighty oak to hold my confusion give me a desert to hold my fears give me a sunset to hold my wonder, give me an ocean to hold my tears, for I am open and I am willing, for to be hopeless would seem so strange, it dishonors those who've gone before us, so lift me up 
to the light of change. Could we unmute ourselves that was and beautiful. give great, great, great <laughs> gratitude <laughs> both to Karen, yeah, Karen A. Robertson so and Michelle Drexillo yeah. for their gifts. We are so <laughs> grateful to song Thank and to them Michelle. and to Thank spirit you. and to love. Yes, we are. Yeah. Thank you. And a, Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And, and a reminder that we stand in fierceness together and we stand yes. in love together. Yes. And um, we um, are so grateful to the new to our new folks who have joined us. We will be reaching out to you and connecting. We will also um, meet again. Our next meeting will be Sunday, April 18th. And we'll be sending note out, but safe Sunday, April 18th. Great gratitude to all of you for bringing your full selves and hearts and spirits and minds. And here we go forward together. Thank you, Thank you, Becky. Thank Thank you. Becky. Thank Love you. to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, both of you. Thank you, Judy.